So uh, let me start with some de uh, some definitions um, because we we often get very confused about what gentrification is and how it relates to displacement and whether it's good or bad and there's a, a lot of media articles about this. Um, so I try and start with simple um, and narrow definitions of gentrification and displacement to so we're all on the same page. Um, so when I talk about gentrification, I'm talking about um, an influx of capital and an influx of higher income, higher educated residents um, and into a neighborhood that was historically disinvested and is now low income. So you can think of that as a, as a transformative um, movement uh, of, of private and public capital uh, along with people into a neighborhood. Um, displacement happens uh, when households are forced to move um, and they might be uh, forced for economic reasons, the rent go went up and their income can't keep up or it might be physical reasons that their, uh, their place is no longer ha habitable or it can also be exclusionary that they can't move in uh, because rents are just too darn high. Um, and um, often it, it occurs because of investment, like uh, private capital moving into an area, new, new buildings going up, a new transit station, but it also happens because of disinvestment. So we have um, uh, places that we haven't directed investment to um, where there's a lot of population churn. And, um, and that's the story um, that Matt Desmond told in his fame famous book, Evicted. Um, so the, the relationship between gentrification and displacement is often misunderstood. Um, gentrification may lead to displacement, but it doesn't always. So sometimes a neighborhood's gentrifying and people get to stay there for years and years. And this is actually a lot of what we've seen in, in San Francisco is there's been some displacement with gentrification. Um, but some people have been able to stay and, and we could talk about at the end about why that is, um, but it, it, in San Francisco, I would argue there's a lot of policies that have worked to keep people in place. Um, another reason that gentrification may not necessarily lead to displacement is sometimes it happens after displacement. Um, so that you have, you, have, um, you have speculators, for instance, that are, are gradually evicting people from buildings um, in anticipation that down the road, maybe decades from, from now, they'll be able to make some money. Um, so often you have displacement first and then gentrification. So the relationship's not clear. It's not a necessary uh, relationship. It doesn't always happen. And that's why it's, it's very confusing to people and you have, have debates about whether gentrification is good or bad because we all wanna have investment in our neighborhoods and we all wanna see revitalization. Um, but sometimes there's displacement and in that case, uh, then, it's, then it's bad. Um, okay, so that those are our basic definitions um, and we can, I'm happy to come back to this in the Q and A if there's still some confusion over, over uh, gentrification displacement 101. Um, so I want to just give some examples of, of gentrification and displacement. And so just to make sure that um, we're all having the same kind of image in our head. Um, now, the idea of gentrification came up um, in London um, in a neighborhood just like this, a working class neighborhood. So there was a sociologist by the name of Ruth Glass who uh, noticed this phenomenon that um, instead of having urban decline, you were having urban ascension, um, that you had neighborhoods that were traditionally working class that were actually uh, attracting the gentry, thus the term gentrification. And uh, of course now uh, you see, see this sort of revitalization of uh, historic flats all over uh, London. London's probably one of the most gentrified uh, cities out there. Um, and uh, so it, it, it's had a long start because this was already happening in, in the 1960s. Um, 
you see this in the Bay Area in a number of different forms, um, uh, but you know we've seen it all over the East Bay and parts of San Francisco and now parts of San Jose. Um, and often it's uh, because people are, they buy a property um, uh, in a lower income area and they fix it up. Um, and um, some people fix it up through sweat equity and with the intention to live there um, and raise their kids in the neighborhood. And then others fix it up um, like this one, which my contractor fixed up. Um, he bought it at the bottom of the uh, real estate curve. And you can see here in 2001, when prices were low, he bought it, he fixed it up and then he sold it when prices were high um, in 2007. Um, and so, so some people do this kind of uh, renovation um, to extract capital. So, um, so you have all kinds of motives, which again is why this is such a complicated phenomenon. Another form of gentrification is what you call new build gentrification. And it's interesting because there's some interesting work on uh, global gentrification, gentrification all over the world. And in most of the rest of the world, and particularly in Asia, a lot of the neighborhood change, a lot of the what you call gentrification is through new construction of uh, high rise residential towers. Um, and so this is, um, you know, it's it partly cultural that instead of renovating older buildings, um, you'll see lots of new buildings go up, demolition and new buildings, and that's what gentrification looks like there. This example is, is Chinatown, where you're seeing both. You're seeing both the new build gentrification and the renovation of the older tenement buildings. Another way to think about gentrification is in terms of commercial and cultural gentrification. So this is an example of a neighborhood um, supermarket in the Mission District in the Latino area, and um, which then gets replaced um, with a empanada store. Actually, this, the, these empanadas are so good. They are the best empanadas in the Bay Area. If you get a chance, uh, go there. But uh, what's interesting here is that there's really a cultural appropriation that um, this, this traditional mom and pop grocery store, uh, Mexican owned, um, was bought up and um, replaced um, by this uh, empanada cafe, which is catering to much higher income uh, clientele. And uh, this, is, this is the sort of gentrification um, th th that it, it includes displacement. So we have a loss of a mom and pop store. And also this is very upsetting for local residents that are losing um, their, the amenities that they uh, have long relied on in their neighborhood um, and that they even identify with culturally. And so this is, this is where uh, you see a lot of, of anti-gentrification protesting um, because of, of the loss of, of, of culture and, um, and community. This is another example of cult, what I would call cultural gentrification. And you look here, this is here we're in the Tenderloin and we're looking at a uh, martini bar called Olive um, in the middle of a set of Vietnamese uh, stores. Um, now, I don't know the story here. There might've been a business displaced, there might not have been, um, but, um, but th there's certainly an incongruity here. Um, in, in um, that is is bringing outsiders. It's bringing a regional market into this very local uh, Vietnamese neighborhood in the Tenderloin. And again, this is a global phenomenon. This this is this is in Shanghai. You can see an example of uh, of gentrification. Um, that I read about in, in somebody's dissertation that I thought was really fascinating that, uh, that you have the same sort of commercial gentrification that uh, is, is disrupting neighborhood uh, retail um, in that context. Um, so I mentioned before, um, the displacement, it doesn't always follow gentrification and it doesn't always precede it, uh, it but it, it exists nonetheless and um, is a, a 
a widespread phenomenon um, in areas that are strong markets like the Bay Area. So this is a, this is a protest in Chinatown for Ellis Act e e evictions. Um, but it's important to think about all the different forms displacement can take. Um, and I love this table um, really because it comes from a report in 1978. And so every time I look at it, I remember that, hey, we've been talking about this topic for 45 years. Um, and HUD did some of the very best studies of displacement in the 1970s. And um, there's actually very little uh, that we can say about it that wasn't already said uh, by theorists uh, such as Peter Marcuse um, 30 or 40 years ago. Um, and uh, so what, what, what this chart always reminds uh, me is that the various forms displacement can take. Um, and, um, it, and a lot of it, again, has to do with, with neighborhood decline, with phenomenons like a, a abandonment of, of buildings or arson, um, or uh, just simple code enforcement. This happens all the time. We hear about it a lot in contexts like East Palo Alto, where um, there's um, overcrowding and, um, and the, the building inspectors will come in and, and red tag buildings and, and people are no longer allowed to live um, in the garage or where they had been living, um, where, where they've been trying to find space um, because, of, because of code enforcement. Um, and then you have, of course, other phenomena like that have to do with public investment, like highway construction or public building construction. Um, you have planning and zoning decisions. Um, you have um, um, urban renewal and all, all these different reasons uh, that displacement is happening around us that uh, you know we, we do not acknowledge that housing is a human right in, in the US context. Um, and um, for this reason, we have these uh, number of uh, ways in which capital and the state um, have uprooted communities and we haven't had any recourse. Um, I add a bullet point here on, on exclusionary displacement. So Peter, again, Peter Marcuse made, wrote this brilliant piece about how um, we, we need to think of displacement, not just of, as people being pushed out of their communities, but people not being able to move in to different neighborhoods because they're, they're, um, they're priced out and, um, and there's um, not enough new construction going on to accommodate them. Um, and I'm gonna talk about that um, in a couple minutes. Okay, so I just wanna talk about why we should care very briefly um, now that we've sort of established um, what gentrification is and, and what displacement is. Um, and, you know, so the, the reason for public intervention here um, is that displacement has many adverse outcomes, both on an individual level and on a societal level. Um, so adverse outcomes. Um, so there's, there's been numerous studies on health outcomes of uh, people that lose their homes. Um, there's uh, you know, a set of um, outcomes that come from, uh, from having housing instability where the fact that often people that, that are displaced begin a chain of displacements where they can no longer, they, they get a temporary place to move and they can't hold on to that. They can move to another place and another place, another place. Um, and um, that uh, causes mental stress and, and can even cause physical stress. Um, there's a fabulous book called Root Shock by Mindy Fullalove, which just documents the mental health challenges of displacement. Um, there's a number of outcomes uh, that are disruptive for, for um, economic uh, well being as well. Um, so, very often when people lose their home, they lose um, a place to live in proximity to their work. And so they end up with longer uh, commutes, um, and that impacts quality of life and mental health um, um, as well. 
Um, and then there's a set of, of um, negative outcomes associated with education. If we have people that are displaced from their homes, um, their children often have to move to a new school. And we've seen study after study showing that um, when you are uprooted um, from school after school, you tend to be less likely to finish your education, um, less likely to go to college, uh, less likely um, to have uh, earnings gains once you will finally enter the, the workforce. So these are the individual outcomes um, that have been established. Um, but there's also a high cost of, of segregation um, more generally that we uh, need to think about. Um, that as you know, often gentrifying areas are in the process of becoming segregated. So originally they were low income, they gradually become higher income. Um, and, uh, and, and we also have displacement from higher income neighborhoods where, where um, people are getting priced out. Um, and the costs of that segregation to society, again, have been, have been well documented in terms of having segregated schools, um, in terms of um, political polarization, uh, in terms of uh, poor outcomes and economic uh, mobility. Um, and, the, and finally, I think we need to think about the, the distrust of government um, that arises um, from allowing displacement to happen. And this, this goes back to the 1940s and 50s and 60s and uh, urban renewal and the, the disruption and displacement of tens of thousands of families. Um, it was actually about 300,000 families displaced by urban renewal and another 300,000 families displaced by the Interstate Highway Act. And that has had a, a long-term legacy um, on, on how communities view um, the government, whether we're talking about federal, uh, state or local government. Um, we have a growing uh, distrust of, of public sector um, and, and any time the public sector tries to go back and uh, make an intervention, whether it's a new transit station or, um, um, or, uh, you know, or new public facilities or, or, uh, or, or whatever public investment we're trying to make, um, this, this long-term distrust comes into being comes into play again uh, uh, because of these kind of the, the memory of, of urban renewal and what it did um, 50 or 60 years ago. Um, and this distrust of government then of course plays out in terms of our democracy and, and how, how uh, committed we are to the public good as, as a society. So the, there are big picture implications um, to these uh, micro actions in, in, our, in our cities and communities. So let's talk a bit about the East Bay and uh, gentrification in the East Bay. Um, and, and let's look at some patterns of gentrification um, and then also look at the types of displacement that are taking place um, in the Bay Area. And I just chose the East Bay here. I, I know some folks are from San Francisco and Santa Rosa and I um, uh, just uh, was picking on the East Bay because uh, they, they, we probably have the best data for the East Bay, frankly. Um, so this is some of our maps from the Urban Displacement Project, which I had. Um, and so let me just uh, orient you to our maps. What we have done is we have mapped um, gentrification and displacement and exclusion um, in many different cities across the United States. And here I'm just zooming in on our Bay Area maps. And um, we did this just really to, to let people know um, what was going on around them and to give, give communities um, you know, a kind of consciousness of where they stood in the region in terms of how, uh, how stable they were, how, um, uh, how diverse they were. Um, so we have a number of different indicators we show on these maps. But the basic punchline here, um, is that you're either a purple neighborhood or an orange neighborhood. If you're a purple neighborhood, you are a low income neighborhood um, that is uh, in the process of gentrifying. The darker ones are uh, advanced gentrification. And if you're an orange neighborhood, 
you're a moderate or high income neighborhood um, that is exclusive. And um, chances are that over time, you're losing your lower income population. And you can see this if you dig down into the statistics um, for the Oakland Hills, for the Berkeley Hills, um, you can see that, that there was uh, much more income diversity um, even 10 years ago, but certainly 30 years ago um, than there is today. Because over time, um, low and moderate income households are getting, are getting priced out. Um, and so, uh, so there's exclusionary displacement going on in, in these hell areas. Um, so you'll see here, so I mentioned that purple was gentrification and you can see here that we've, we've identified a number of neighborhoods in South Berkeley and North Oakland um, in West Oakland uh, that were low income and have gentrified and are now in a state of, of advanced um, uh, gentrification. Um, and then we have some neighborhoods which are blue. And uh, those are the neighborhoods where actually there's no very little gentrification at all. Very little. And instead, there's a lot of turnover that there's a lot of there's continuing disinvestment in many places. And this is like out International Boulevard, but also places along San Pablo. Um, we think of San Pablo Avenue as being a gentrification corridor um, from uh, you know, El Cerrito down to Oakland, but, but you know, it, there's actually a huge amount of population turnover, a, a very large low income population. And you can um, sort of look at the statistics, I'm just drilling down into a West Berkeley area, and you can see this, this is an area that's still mostly low income. Um, it's growing, um, its rents are increasing. Um, it has a rent gap, which means that rents are lower there than in the surrounding areas. Um, so eventually it may gentrify, but it has not gentrified um, yet. Um, so we've, we've done this kind of analysis and, um, and it's great data to have if you wanna kind of go to your city council and make an argument for, for um, that we need to do something to, to stabilize our communities. Um, let's talk a little bit um, about uh, why this happens. Um, and we've done some analysis of this, um, why we have um, certain neighborhoods that um, gentrify and certain other neighborhoods that exclude. Um, and we find a very high correlation um, to the red lining maps in the, the homeowners loan corporation. And, and I'm assuming that this is a, a, an audience that has heard about these maps that kind of dictated where, um, where banks um, could lend or should lend um, and shouldn't lend. Um, and, um, and even when we, we stopped officially redlining, um, these were industry practices that continued on for decades. Um, and so we had steering uh, into certain neighborhoods and, and out of others um, um, and informal practices that kind of perpetuated um, these maps. So the, so the redlined areas, and here again, we're looking at Berkeley, which is uh, why I wanted to talk about the East Bay today. It's not, we don't have redlining maps for a lot of the Bay Area because um, a lot of the Bay Area was developed after the HOLC was active, um, but we have beautiful maps of, of the East Bay and, and San Francisco. But at any rate, you can see what the areas in the flats, which were redlined, and then the areas in the hills, um, which were um, it de declared to be the best areas um, to invest. And um, so when we look at the correlation between gentrification and the red line or, 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 or yellow areas, and 83% of the gentrifying areas were, were um, uh, declared as hazardous or declining um, by the HOLC and, um, and went through a long period of disinvestment. And at once you, if you disinvest for decades and decades, um, you can come in and make a profit. Once the market turns and goes up, you can make a big profit quickly. And so that's, that's one of the reasons that there's been uh, so much gentrification 
in these areas. Um, and then conversely, the exclusionary areas that we show on our maps um, were, were uh, rated as, as, as very, uh, as the best ones historically. So these, these practices, uh, this was, you know, almost a hundred years ago now, think about it, it was 80 years ago that these maps came out. Um, and, but they, they, they have long repercussions. Um, and, and this is just one uh, policy of, of many that kind of dictated um, the economic fortunes of our neighborhoods till today. Um, another uh, policy to think about is exclusionary zoning. And I see that uh, I saw noticed earlier that Dorothy Walker was here, which I'm just thrilled about because uh, uh, she's had uh, went on a campaign that really raised the awareness of ex about exclusionary zoning uh, in in uh, in um, in Berkeley, California, and um, has really resulted in the council's actions uh, last year to end exclusionary zoning or to begin that process of ending exclusionary zoning in Berkeley. It's gonna take a long time to do. Um, but I love this um, visual, which was done by my colleagues at the Other and Belonging Institute. At, on the Berkeley campus. I just think it's a beautiful example of a visualization. So just to orient you, so darker, darker blue, it means more white, uh, higher share white population and yellow um, is the lower share white population. Um, and the, the dots are the single family areas and, um, and, and which is most of, of Berkeley, well, certainly most of the hills. Uh, is only uh, is exclusively single family, um, and then the hatched areas are the ones that are um, are uh, mixed residential zones, but pri actually primarily single family as well. Um, and it just illustrates so powerfully how um, how we've had patterns of racial exclusion that have followed. Um, the boundaries of our zones uh, for so many uh, years, zones that were put in place with the invention of zoning at the beginning of the 20th century. So we're talking, you know, 120 years, um, and those those zones are still having an impact today. Um, and um, we still have, uh, again, a tremendous amount of uh, exclusion and an inability um, to build much housing in these primarily white neighborhoods. So what are we gonna do about it? Um, I'll talk for about five minutes more and then we can wrap up on, and have a policy discussion. So the first thing um, I'd like to talk about um, is the housing uh, shortage in, in California. And uh, this is Dowell Meyer's work um, showing um, how we built housing at a very high rate in the 1960s and, and 70s. Um, it was a cyclical pattern. So, you know, there's, as the business cycle turns, there's a slowdown in the real estate cycle. Um, um, but consistently, um, you know, we, we built 160,000 uh, permits um, or more per year um, in um, over the last 60 years. And um, we were growing rapidly in population in the 60s, but we're, we're, uh, we're still growing um, in population generally, and yet our housing production has tapered uh, considerably. So, so it's pretty well established that we have a shortage of new housing construction. Um, in California, that's about 2.8 million units, according to Professor Myers. Um, and uh, in the Bay Area, um, that's uh, something around 20% um, yeah, um, of that. Um, and um, and we, we don't have that much housing in the pipeline. Um, and right now is we're actually having a lot of struggles uh, building housing. And there's a lot of reasons uh, why it's hard. It's expensive um, and um, communities often fight having new housing in their neighborhoods. Um, but without new housing, um, we'll find that we'll have a lot of gentrification and displacement because there's no place to go except 
um, low income neighborhoods to find housing if you don't have uh, new housing being built. Um, so if you look at where we've actually built housing in the Bay Area, this is, this is a map um, that we just uh, produced for some research on, on um, market rate housing production and displacement. And it's a one of a kind map. Nobody has done this map to our knowledge. We know how many units were built on every block in the Bay Area. Um, this took a, a year to put together. Um, and um, what we, and so the higher red um, is, are the blocks that have uh, uh, more housing. Um, and, uh, but most of the area is, um, is yellow um, or light orange, which means that most, uh, blocks have built um, one unit or five units. Um, and you'll see that there's a lot of blank on the map. So a lot of communities have not uh, built any housing at all. And in fact, the median block group in the Bay Area has not built any housing in the last 20 years. So we are just not uh, building. And when we do build, we build in the suburbs. So where you see the red, You'll see it there out there in Livermore and San Ramon and Antioch and Vallejo, Vacaville and south of San Jose. And um, the reason this is a problem, there are multiple reasons this is a problem. One is that it's forcing people to drive more um, to and uh, because the jobs remain in the core of the region. So people have to drive um, hours for their commute, which then creates a quality of life concerns and greenhouse gas emissions, which are problematic. Um, um, and uh, uh, there's, there's many different issues also um, with the, the types of job opportunities and educational opportunities that are out in the su suburbs. And there's a new issue that we should all be cognizant of, which is that we're building many of those units out in the wildland urban interface. Um, so most of California's new construction is going into areas that are high at risk of fire. Um, so that is um, a reason that we really need to redouble our efforts um, to build in our core uh, neighborhoods. And uh, you can see here that in the East Bay, the area that we're talking about that most of the gentrification has taken place, there's been very, very, very little construction. So that's, that's one uh, big policy implication um, that we need to welcome um, newcomers in our neighborhoods, or we need to welcome our own grandchildren into our neighborhoods and stop making them move uh, far away. Um, there's different ways to do that. Um, there's a push right now to do um, some more missing middle housing. Um, and this, this is a way of uh, adding gentle density to neighborhoods, um, adding uh, uh, duplexes, triplexes. Um, this can be made affordable by, by subdividing existing uh, older buildings. So instead of uh, making McMansions, we should take our older houses um, and uh, turn them into fourplexes. Um, and this would be a, a way of, of quickly getting uh, to significant amounts of density. We've already done this with accessory dwelling units. Um, this is, this is a, a map I produced years ago when we began to advocate for accessory dwelling units. And um, our folks in the Berkeley City Council said, I think there was a, it was a council member in North Berkeley said, I wanna see if we implement these accessory dwelling unit laws, how many will, will there be in my neighborhood? So we created, my students created this map. Um, we just did some, we did some estimates of, of how many units the new bill would produce. Um, and it's, it's one every block, some blocks have two, uh, but it's very unobtrusive. Um, the, the picture is actually of my own accessory dwelling unit that I built in my back right, backyard as, a, as an example. Um, but this, uh, it has actually turned out to be quite a revolution in California. We've had 23,000 accessory dwelling units built in the last three years uh, through a concerted effort um, to, to change laws at the state and local level. Um, and uh, so this is a, this is a great um, way to add um, 
density. I call it democratizing density because this is not profiting the, you know, the big development industry. This is, um, this is the, something that families are doing so that they can have intergenerational living. Um, and um, to the extent that their property value increases, um, it goes to the grandchildren, not to foreign investors. So I, I, it's a, it's a, it's a win-win, I think. Um, but I'll just wrap up with saying that there's a number of other different policies that we need to think about when we think about gentrification and displacement. Um, and this is a chart I like to refer to because I, I, it summarizes all the different things we can do. Um, and uh, this is, uh, I like to say that displacement is, and, and the housing crisis generally is like climate change. You don't want to just do solar. You want to do solar, wind, and uh, whatever else you need uh, to do to, to reduce greenhouse gas emissions um, and slow global warming. So just to, in the same way, we have to do all of these things um, to, to, um, to mitigate our housing crisis in California. So this goes from um, on the left, um, remedies that are really short term that are saving buildings and saving tenants and keeping them in place. So um, just cause um, protections, which um, uh, we found is actually one of the most effective ways to keep um, communities in place. Um, tenant rental assistance and counseling education is just critical here, people uh, knowing their rights or, or knowing where they can get um, uh, $600 to, to help pay the rent when they uh, uh, lose their job suddenly. So there's these short-term remedies, but then there's also long-term remedies. And this, you know, in planning, we think about 30-year timeframes. So we kind of have to act in that 30-year timeframe at the same time as we're acting in real time. And in the 30 year time frame, there's, there's a number of different um, mechanisms we could use in terms of um, uh, you know, zoning, in terms of taking our public lands and using them more strategically um, for, um, for affordable housing construction. Um, there's uh, land acquisition funds that we should be using before the cost of land gets too high, uh, particularly in, in uh, areas like Santa Rosa and uh, uh, more outlying areas. And then there's a number of policies that we uh, that have been shown to be effective that we should really turn to um, on a city and state level. Um, things like condo conversion restrictions have actually been tremendously effective in slowing down. Uh, speculation and uh, keeping keeping renters in place. Um, so I'm going to end there because I see there's a number of questions in the chat. Yeah, and and in Q and A. So I'm going to do those first because they came in first. Um, how has development? Ran asks, how has development in California changed, if at all, since the elimination of redevelopment agencies? Well, that's such a great question. Um, so, um, so Jerry Brown eliminated redevelopment um, when he came in as governor. Um, I think he had a um, he just began to mistrust it as mayor of Oakland and decided it didn't work very well. Maybe it was um, there was a, some abuse of the law. But the 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 uh, you know, I had, I was actually supportive at the time of eliminating redevelopment um, because of the because I saw that the money um, it, that it wasn't that effective that the we were getting growth anyway in ma many places and it wasn't um, having it its its intended effects. But the one the one very sad side effect of eliminating redevelopment was the loss of of funding for affordable housing. So it was a it was a concerted, a dedicated uh, pool. It ranged in different places. It was it was high it highest in San Francisco, which added on its own own laws uh, to the redevelopment law, and, and was able to get up to twenty five percent affordable in some places. Um, but the um, but everywhere you had a, a affordable uh, mandate of um, you know of of I think it was fifteen percent. Now I can't even remember. It was so long ago. Um, but that that funding pool, we never replaced it really. 
at the state. So that was a huge loss. I don't think it, it's enough. Again, we have, we have to do 40 different things to have affordability in California, but it's one piece of the puzzle that would be great to have back in some form. Right. Um, Heather is asking, do you have any thoughts about the effects of aging in place movement on housing? I'm a realtor and what I see is elders not releasing their too large homes to the families who need them. Do you know of any research in this area? She has yeah. an extension to the question too at the bottom. If you see her, she has an add on to her clarify. Yeah, the follow up is, is. Go ahead. Oh, well, she sees as the focus follow up to my question, I see the focus on new construction, and I'm assuming you don't mean new, and the resistance to it. Wouldn't elders downsizing be at least a partial solution? Yeah, so I totally agree. You know, we, um, so when Carol Galante started the Turner Center, um, the, one of the first little studies she did was of overhousing, um, and there's a blog on it on her website, which was, is really great, and then we did a look at it. We looked at San Mateo County. We were actually doing a study on ADUs, and we thought, well, well, it, let's look at overhousing because if maybe people that have too much house would be amenable to dividing some of it and creating a smaller unit, even if it's just for the, their in-laws, um, you know, but that would be a, a way to solve the housing uh, sh uh, shortage. And true, sure enough, we saw in San Mateo County that about 50% of homeowners are overhoused, meaning they had way more bedrooms than they had people. Um, so you have have this kind of legacy of uh, people aging in place and um, and um, and being in this inflexible housing. I mean, I don't I don't blame them. I um, I blame their uh, the this type, this single family detached housing type that is um, is actually um, very hard to divide into smaller units. Um, and often uh, isn't, uh, uh, it, it's very hard to put another kitchen in or another entrance, um, or the zoning doesn't permit it. Um, and um, so there's really even, even more than a housing supply problem, it's a housing mismatch problem. Um, and I think we're, we're never going to be able to solve it unless we kind of build up the industry capacity to do large scale conversions of this older single family fabric that we are stuck with. Um, and, um, it, you know, we, we're, we're, um, we're still overbuilding single family for re related to demand. Um, yeah. Just because it's cheap, it's cheap to build and you can build it out in the middle of the Central Valley. So, so absolutely. Um, yeah. It's also very isolating for older people. That's right. Uh, Ellen asks, a huge amount of new housing in the Broadway corridor in Oakland, large apartment buildings, which I would say are market rate, has that made a dent? Yeah, that's interesting. I've been wondering that myself. And my feeling about it, here's, I, you know, I haven't seen studies on it and maybe I, they may exist out there, but my feeling about it is that a lot of those buildings um, are not making a dent in our gentrification displacement issues because they're not building big enough units. There's a, one of my students, Tiffany Eng, founded a nonprofit called Family Friendly Oakland. Oakland. And it was because she and her husband um, and her two, they're both housers, they lived in um, downtown Oakland and then they had two kids and they couldn't, um, they, they just didn't have enough room. They couldn't find a three bedroom and then they couldn't get their kids into the, right. find a school and blah, blah. So the family friendly Oakland you need. And, and, um, but, and they just couldn't find three or four unit um, units downtown. So is, is, as long as if we don't build that type, then, um, then young families will head to the single family housing stock. And because they can't afford a RINDA, they're going to head to East Oakland and they're going to displace the community. So, uh, so I don't think we've been very thoughtful about this. I mean, we could regulate, we could regulate, we could say these have to be minimum three bedrooms. You have to have 
thirty percent three bedrooms or more, um, and you know, there would be zoning solutions here, and I don't think we've been creative enough. Uh, Robert asks, uh, you said San Francisco has done a relatively good job at preventing displacement. Can you say more about those policies? Yes, there. Most of them are on this list. I. Um, you know, um, so San, Fran San Francisco, um, you know, first of all, um, over half of the rent renter units in San Francisco are rent, rent protected in some form. So they're either public housing, they're nonprofit affordable housing built often through inclusionary um, zoning, um, it, or they are, um, are rent controlled. Um, now rent control can have the adverse effect of ex excluding people. Um, so it's rent control has made it harder for low income folks to move into San Francisco, but at the same time, it has protected the low income folks who are there. So, you know, I always say, why is San Francisco not entirely gentrified? It should be, it, it just like, it should be just like Manhattan, right? And it's not, it's still diverse. Um, and the reason it's, it's diverse is because it has it has almost all of these policies that you see here on my wish list. Um, and so it's done really everything right. It's, it's the poster child. And I know we, we beat up on it a lot uh, for not doing enough, um, but it's, it's done pretty, pretty well. Uh, Aaron asks, some object to certain anti-displacement policies, uh, excuse me, policies, e.g. rent control, inclusionary zoning, because they believe they will discourage new housing production, thereby exacerbating the housing problem. How would you respond to this? Is it possible to do both? And if so, how? Yeah, it is possible to do both. I think, you know, I think, so again, the Turner Center has a very good set of um, uh, policy briefs on rent control and advocating that we should, um, we need to just, um, make sure that it doesn't uh, that building it doesn't apply to buildings until they're 30 years old so you know we so developers can still make their money and uh, they'll have plenty of time to make their money and then rent control will kick in so it should be for older buildings i think uh, you know we've we've uh, uh, you know we we we've been sort of black and white about it you know we have in in cities like san francisco and berkeley we have rent control that is capped at like 1995 or 1989. And when we haven't made it for the newer buildings, um, but you could probably make it, you know, for buildings now that now that are 30 years old. So you can make it go up to 1992 in Berkeley um, or, you know, so you can, you need to have it rolling um, over time. Um, and um, so then, so, so we need to do these rolling laws and then the places that don't have them need to actually implement them. Um, inclusionary zoning, uh, it, yeah, so you have to be very, very careful about the market. It's just not going to work everywhere. And, you know, certainly if San Francisco and Berkeley are, are, you know, places where prices will keep going up, that it's just going to get less affordable. Um, our, you know, our grandchildren and beyond are never going to be able to afford to move into to Berkeley and, and San Francisco. There's global demand. So, so that places like that need to take advantage of inclusionary housing and implement it. Uh, but I, you know, I'm not so gung ho on Richmond or Oakland um, having strict inclusionary housing because their markets have proven to be up and down, frankly. Right. Uh, Sarah is asking, is there any movement towards creating co-housing and helping to cut red tape so that they can be brought into life more quickly than the typical three to five years? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, I don't know specifically about what legislation is out there um, right now on, on co-housing, but I do know that, I mean, there's definitely a movement um, towards towards liberalizing our, our laws and, and um, creating more diverse housing types and, and using different forms of tenure to preserve, uh, to preserve affordability. Um, so I would expect to see a lot of action on that front in, in coming years. Um, ben is asking, is there a connection between building market rate housing and gentrification? Can building enough market rate help lower housing costs across the board? And how do we ensure that low-income housing is built at the same time 
would building public slash social housing be best? Yes, yes, yes. yes. Um, so, <laughs> so yeah, you know, I, I think, you know, social housing is the answer. So we could just stop there. But so we, you know, we just did a study on market rate housing. It's coming out and, um, and we find it does help that it, it, it creates it, it, even low income housing house and low income households move in more when there's market rate production so that there is um, there is a trickle down effect that said there's also more displacement when you have a uh, new market rate construction so it's just it creates more churn so it hurts some low income existing residents it benefits some new low income residents how do we then make sure that those low in, existing low income residents are not displaced and with their lives and fortunes disrupted? Um, we need there, there's no answer other than social housing or um, or or large scale housing preservation programs, which I, I think we really need to think about. Community land trusts. Let, can we buy um, buy affordable apartment buildings and make sure they stay uh, affordable in perpetuity? Um, we need to be more. Um, Bart is making sta a statement here that you might want to comment on. California has always been dominated by real estate development forces, and we see that in the role state government is now playing. Pressure on communities is for the production of market rate rental housing, which is raising land values and increasing rents. Accessory units are nice for elders and their families, but we have no evidence that they are affecting the availability of low cost housing. I am concerned that all we are building is rentals. We know that family wealth depends on ownership, yet we are creating a population that will never be able to buy anything. I think that this is a new form of redlining. Interesting. Well, yeah, Thanks. I think it is an interesting statement. I think that there's a couple, couple things that, uh, so yes, it's a home ownership is a proven way to accumulate wealth. Uh, the question is whether we can actually make it work now in in um, in the Bay Area. And I mean, we've struggled. I mean, there's been a lot of experimentation with like in individual development accounts with um, wealth building for low income families. And um, and this, the consensus in the Bay Area is that it's so expensive to get into the market that it makes it really hard. That, and so there's been actually, I mean, there's other ways of doing it. There's like the Oakland Community Land Trust, which um, is, is, a, is not such a big lift getting into the market. It's less equity though. So you can't, you don't get the windfall that you would um, otherwise. I wanna just take um, umbrage with the idea that we haven't studied accessory units and affordability because we have. Um, I think we've, I've done three studies on it and um, I can tell you they're affordable by design. They're just, they are, they're so much cheaper to build um, because there's no, you don't have to buy land and you don't have to buy half the infrastructure. Um, so people are renting them for cheaper and this is happening all over the state. Um, and so it's, it's this kind of naturally occurring um, or affordable by design stock. Um, and um, that's most are renting it for for at, at affordable rates, even to arm's length tenants, even to people they've never known before. Um, so I, you know, I think we we should look at it more seriously as a, as a affordability solution. You know, we have a couple other statements here, and in the interest of time, though, I'm just going to go to the chat question, and this will be our last question. What is your feeling about high rise housing? Um, well, so you, I think you need, uh, you need to look at it in context. Um, and, uh, you so, so, you know, I'm not sure I would put a 50 story building in the Berkeley Hills. Um, I, I would feel fine with a 50 story building in downtown uh, Berkeley. Um, and it would give another place for the Falcons to go. Um, yeah, uh, so, but, you know, I think in general, um, the Bay Area has been very conservative about high rise housing and, um, and it's been very, it, and it's preserved the green belt and the, the feeling of the closeness to nature in a brilliant way. 
Um, that said, you can look at cities around the world that have also preserved um, that connection to nature and yet have a, a high rise uh, building stock. Um, and um, you, can, you can take even Hong Kong, you can take Toronto where I am right now, um, fabulous high rises and fabulous parks and open spaces and views. Um, so it can be done. And I, and I think California is gonna have to um, get over its aversion to high rise, unfortunately, if it's gonna solve its housing crisis and build enough housing. Final word, would you like to say a final word? Um, yeah, I think, I think we, you know, we all sort of have to link arms and um, I, I kept my list, my long wish list of housing uh, policies up here for a reason that I think we have to keep um, focused on all of them. And I, you know, it, to me, it's, I've, it's always made me very sad that, you know, the tenant protection folks are fighting uh, market rate construction and the market rate construction folks don't pay any attention to housing preservation. And, you know, it just seems a little bit silly to be fighting each other when it, it should be something that we're all working on all aspects of at the same time. Well, thank you, Dr. Chappell. Thanks, Carrie. And uh, I guess, uh, Carrie, we'll see you next year for next year's program. Great. Thank Thanks. you, everyone who participated.